Sandman was a unique opportunity for a CGI. We had to understand how the sand behaved to create Sandman. Well, I've always loved Sandman. I've always, I've been waiting for Sandman to be a villain in one of these movies. We've loved the visuals and the image of the Sandman, and we're always trying to find an adversary for Spider-Man, you know, who is, is, you know, almost impossible to defeat. I see it as an honor. I really, these movies stand tall in the pantheon of, of superhero movies. Sandman was created first and most importantly by Stan Lee when he wrote the comic books in the 60s. When I did Sandman, I said to myself, Stan, I think this time you're going too far. Nobody is going to accept somebody who could turn his body into sand and ooze under a door and then make his body so rock hard that he could use his hand like a club and knock a wall over. And now he's starring in a movie, in a Spider-Man movie. I think that's wild. He was one of the, the Sinister Six. He's one of the very first villains that appeared in the run. Um, and what was fascinating about him in the, in the comic books is Spider-Man literally couldn't grab onto him. Spider-Man throws a web net on him, he goes through the net, he tries to grab him, he can run, the sand just go, really, literally runs through Peter's fingers. Spider-Man has now faced a villain that, that he, can't, he can't grab onto. Tom, when we ran into Tom for the first time, kind of up close, it was in the AFI award, and Laura and I were looking at him like, Sandman, Sandman? Thomas Hayden Church was nominated for something, and he won, and he got up on stage and he cried. And I turned to Avi and I said, could he be the Sandman? And um, Avi said, yeah. And we brought him in, and Sam met him and loved him, and uh, that was that. He had this look, and then his voice, and he can, he, he is very strong. At the same time, he plays great victim. The role is written amazingly, and Thomas is fantastic in, in the movie. A lot of people know me from, you know, being a television actor in the 90s, and I think that I just, you know, it's just the fact that you see a guy that you've probably been familiar with for a long time, and then suddenly, you know, thrown into the frying pan of an action movie, I think a lot of people have, have been a little bemused by, by that, you know, that they hired a guy like me to get the crap kicked out of him a lot. Where'd he go? In, you know, in a classic kind of comic book accident, he gets atomized and uh, he becomes the Sandman. There is this great internal struggle with a guy like Sandman, and it's a great sort of motif of this guy who's literally continually falling apart. He's like, a, he's like a waterfall of inability to maintain who he is and who he wants to be. But the, the balance of that is, is you don't want him to look like he's too fragile and falling apart. You want him to look like he can beat the bejesus on the Spider-Man. That sort of changing character is, is, is an interesting idea. In terms of costume, it's very simple, but we're asked in this department to kind of go beyond that. So we design various stages of it, different scales of it, um, and I work with um, wonderful sculptors to uh, create maquettes. We did my entire body casting. First they powder you down, and then you, you put it in the box, and then they fill it up with plaster. A head cast is about the whole process is going to take about an hour and a half, but they're actually in under alginate and plaster bandage for about 45 minutes. Every time I go to the wardrobe department, it's startling to see my own polyurethane head, you know, screaming at me. The mock gets were used as a basis for 
you know, even the movement of the characters and stuff. There was discussions as to which weapons he would have, so we sculpted just a maquette of Thomas Hayden Church and then made different versions of weapons that would slide onto that arm, so in a meeting with everybody, they could see the different variations of weapons and, and kind of decide what they wanted to go with. Well, I think that works great for this, this, part, of, this part of the scene. It works just great. When it came time to bring him to the screen, the realization of that, which is really the director and the filmmaker's job, we had to first study sand, because this is the thing that we were going to recreate in the computer. One of the first things that I did on the movie was work with Sam and Bill Pope, the director of photography, to organize a sand shoot. And it was shooting reference of sand, sand thrown up, thrown against blue screen, over black screen. Um, we got every possible reference we could think of based on what the script said, all the different types of motion of sand that we could imagine needing reference for. There's actually a lot of different types of sand. And for us on Spider-Man 3, we have something, uh, what we refer to as Arizona sand. Um, and it's not the type of sand that you would find at, you know, like the Santa Monica beach. Um, it's actually quite coarser. There's a lot more, um, it's almost kind of like in a rocky type material. Once we had our basic understanding of sand and how to photograph it, then came time for the great technicians over at SPI under the supervision of Scott Stockdyke and others to recreate the individual grains of sand in the computer. Sand, I think, has some unique challenges in that it behaves uh, sometimes like a solid and sometimes like a liquid. So what you're seeing behind me is actually a fluid simulation or a gas simulation. So everything in the box is actually a gas simulation and you get a nice turbulent swirl in the motion. But as soon as the particles the sand particles leave that box, they start to collide against the ground and bounce against each other. And although there had been particle animation previous to Spider-Man 3, there had never been anything attempted on the scale, the scope that this project demanded. I think the biggest thing about sand is just the amount of grains that you have. It's just so many grains. I mean, we uh, when we started off, we kind of said, you know what, um, most software packages can do, you know, like, you know, 400,000, 500,000, but I mean, we needed to go into the millions and then beyond and beyond and beyond. So if you see this particular image here, um, there's no reference for scale or anything. When you look at it, it kind of looks like it might be a, a typical rock. Uh, but, you know, this sand grain is actually the size of like a pinhead. Uh, and one of our real complications on this um, is how to get all of these, you know, little pinheads all to mass together to form a human body, which is what our Sandman creature is. You can't just take those large grains of sand and push them back into the distance and then add a few million more because it won't fit into the computer. So the hard part has been to go from this detailed model to the single point of color without seeing any of the transitions in between. Spencer Cook and, uh, and Sam Raimi had a lot of input as to what the desire and will of the character was going to be. So we started out with our direction from them, of course. Uh, and what we needed to do was look at it from the situation of trying to um, capture the character that they want and the emotions they want and balance that with the physical limitations um, and the physical qualities of sand. And it's kind of the combination of those two things that makes it a level of difficulty that is instead of like twice as hard, it's like four times as hard. We're going to a lot of effort to include little bits of ch or chunks of sand falling off of him as he's developing and we're putting that into the character animation as a um, a guide to help the effects animators to know when, like when he moves his shoulder, more stuff would come off and this would have to form a little bit more because he's moving it more. So that kind of interface 
for me and, and for the animators working on that sequence in particular is kind of a new challenge in a way, you know, in, in incorporating the effects animation into the character animation because the effects are such an integral part of who this character is. So from the start, having experience with Alfred Molina on the last show, we knew what it took to make a CG human. So we started that process extremely early, as early as we could. Upper face, part one, take one. You know, we hadn't done any other aspect of performance, and I hadn't really had the opportunity other than the real kind of thumbnail sketches of who he was going to be with Sam. And then I was having to do things like you know, howl and shriek and, you know, and, and, and be sad. A bit on the lips, not too tight, just press it together just a little bit. It was painstaking to do the motion capture stuff, but ultimately everybody in the building is working probably five times harder than you are. You know, and setting up the cameras and the little CG markers, you know, putting all that stuff on you. You know, I really just, participated it wasn't hard but but it was definitely there were some long hours spent doing all the the CG prep stuff Thomas's performance definitely does live in the sand there's many shots where we actually needed to just line up our cameras and CG body exactly with what he did on set because we used some of what he did on set Sam and I would have meetings and we would sit and watch the animatic sequences which are it's almost like rotoscoping animatics, where you can see the dimensionality of the various scenes and what Sam and the rest of the creative core have envisioned. Basically, we work with a software called Maya, and that is a graphical interface that allows us to um, manipulate a 3D object that has been modeled to look like the character. There's uh, the initial animation, of course, and then the simulation of the sand, where you end up with um, kind of like a wireframe, but we're using little plastic spheres to illustrate the shapes. And then once that is handed off, then we have to start coloring it in. So it can take weeks to months, depending on the complexity of the shot. really has taken what Sandman can do and increased it by tenfold. When you do have the Academy Award winning team of Scott Stockdyke and, and his group over at SPI, you put yourself in the right hands, the right creative hands, and you say, you know, go create. And they did, and uh, we couldn't be happier with the results. So really it was a step-by-step -step process, and one that was done with storyboards and animatics and one that was done with the patience of a great deal of technicians using both existing technology and applied technology from other sources being put to use in a new way to achieve the illusion. Uh -huh. 